Hello there, and welcome to the video. So recently I was out photographing. I came across this scene in this old stone quarry. Measured the scene and realized I needed 8 seconds at f22. And then I need to add some time for something called reciprocity failure. But how much should I add? Well, that depends. And this situation actually prompted me to do some research. I share that in a blog post, uh, which can be found in the description and in the comments if you prefer to read. But in my research I came across a couple of things that weren't news to me that I would like to share with you in this video. So let's talk reciprocity. But before we do that, I'd like to mention two things. Firstly, I'm no expert in long exposures. I do them every now and again, but I'm no expert. Instead, the source for this information comes from various internet sources. I've uh, tried to cross-verify them and uh, only include the stuff that sounds reasonable. But take it for what it is and see these as guidelines. Secondly, reciprocity only affects film. So if you're shooting digital, this video isn't for you. And I would also like to mention that I looked at this from the standpoint of shooting black and white negative film. But many of the same principles apply to color as well. What is reciprocity then? Well, that's kind of what we have Wikipedia for, and here's the definition. I would just call it, well, that's how film reacts to light. That a certain threshold, a reciprocity failure occurs, or the Schwarzschild effect that needs to be compensated for. This usually happens at around one second. In practice, it means when you are doing a longer exposure than one second, you need to add a bit of time to the exposure to compensate for that failure. But uh, how much should you add? Well, this is where it gets a bit tricky. In the past, I've just Googled whatever film I was using and reciprocity and gone with one of the top results. And usually that's good enough. But there are a couple of nuances to this. So let's dive into that. Film matter. And different film reacts differently to reciprocity failure. And uh, many of the manufacturers specify this in their datasheet, using some version of the Schwarzschild law. Among others, Ilford does this. They use this formula here, where Tc is the compensating time, Tm being the measured time, and P is a coefficient that changes depending on the film stock. So on that scene from the start of the video, I had uh, measured a time of 8 seconds. Let's say I was shooting Ilford Ort on that. Then the coefficient is 1.25, giving an exposure, compensated exposure time of 13.5 seconds. If I instead were to shoot Ilford SFX, the compensated time would be 19.6 seconds, or about half a stop difference between the two film stocks. However, do note that this isn't a linear correlation. Instead, if we were to map this to a diagram, you'll say a slight bend of the curve. The difference between different film stocks can be huge. Uh, and on Flickr, which is a great resource for us photographers, I found this post by a user named Tobias Abel. And he made this awesome graph showcasing uh, how much reciprocity failure different film stocks suffer. It's a bit old, but I still think it's quite relevant. And from it, we can see that the Filma pans uh, are the worst performers, followed closely by Triax. And best in class, we have uh, Fujifilm Acros and a film called Kodak BW400CN, which was discontinued as of 2013. But it was an old black and white slide film. And in general, slide film suffers very little reciprocity failure. Developing. It strictly affects our negatives. And I came across two interesting principles when researching this. First, we have a post by a user called Spitted Bit on Flickr. And he writes, when compensating for reciprocity failure, the highlights are pushed more than they need to. And he adds in, decreasing the developing time controls those highlights. You can calculate how much they are pushed and decrease time accordingly. And another user adds in, lower the developing time by 10 to 20 percent. It's a bit unsure though. This is also backed by Digital Truth Photo, which are famous for the massive uh, film developing chart, 
and they have a chart for adjusting uh, developing times when doing long exposures. And they suggest uh, underdeveloping by 10 to 30% depending on the exposure time. This also makes sense to me when I think about it. My reasoning being that the highlights should be used up more of that photosensitive materials, more so than the midtones and the shadows, and therefore suffer less of the reciprocity failure. And to protect the highlights, a slight underdeveloping would help. How much you should uh, underdevelop by? I leave unsaid, but I probably would use that chart from Digital Truth Photo as a starting point. I can also speculate that if you use a um, compensating developer, like Semistand developing in Rolunol, you don't need to adjust the time at all. An interesting side note, I found a blog post by S.J. Godfrey, and he states that the dynamic range is increased as a side effect of reciprocity failure. It doesn't uh, give any sources more than night photography by Lance Kemig, and not directly to that statement. However, if we accept that previous statement we made that the highlights risk overexposing and the midtones and the shadows are held back, well, that would mean that the dynamic range would increase as a side effect. This leads us to a follow-up question. What would happen if we have a scene with very narrow dynamic range, a flat scene? Would we still need to underdevelop those negatives? Well, I would say no. My reasoning being, then everything is in about the same exposure value, and all in that scene would suffer the same degree of reciprocity failure, which leads me to believe you don't need to underdevelop. And I found a blog post supporting this idea by uh, James Buttering, who describes himself as a long exposure film photographer. Over at Shoot It With Film, he writes the following. While reciprocity failure always requires you to compensate, by lengthening exposure time, I found that compensation in development is only really necessary in images with a really wide range of tones. But to summarize, if you have your normal, boring, dull scene with flat lightning, then you don't need to compensate in developing. But if you have a high dynamic range scene, consider underdevelop, or perhaps try a compensating developer. How did it go for me then, at the stone quarry there? Well, if you watched my previous video, the last on location video I made, you know the answer. But I made two exposures of that scene, one on Firmapan 100 and one on No Color Studio number 12. And that's two films with vastly different ISO values. One is ISO 100 and the other ISO 6. That's four stops. Of difference. So my exposure on Film Weapon 100, in reality, that exposure was shorter than one second and didn't need to be compensated, which is also backed by the datasheet of Film Weapon, where they state that from one half a second you don't need to compensate for reciprocity failure. Let's say that I had a measured time of eight seconds for Film Weapon 100. How much should I add for reciprocity failure then? Well, there is a chart in the Fomapan 100 datasheet. It's a bit rough though. They only specify times for 1, 10 and 100 seconds. At 1 second they say to double the measured time, and for 10 seconds multiply with 8. However, I needed 8 seconds, not 10. Now what? Well, I could just calculate the step sizes between 1 up to 10 seconds. And if I do that, I arrive at 6.9 times 8 seconds which equals about 55 seconds. I could also say, well, I'm just going to calculate the coefficients to the Swatchai law, the, the one that Ilford used. And if I do that for 10 seconds, I'll get a coefficient of 1.9. If I calculate it for 100 seconds, I'll get a coefficient of 1.6. It's not possible to do these calculations for one second. And then I can say, well, I'm closer to 10 seconds than I am to 100 seconds, so I'm just going to use that. So that's 8 to the power of 1.9, which equals about 52 seconds. I find it quite interesting, though, that the coefficient changed with the measured time. 
This to me indicates that the Schwarzschild law might be flawed. And when researching this, I came across um, these calculations over at Flickr by a user called Yano, and in the comments he states that he made these calculations. They at least look a bit more promising. If they are better, I don't know, but I thought they were worth mentioning. One could also of course just Google FUMAPEN100 and reciprocity failure. That's usually what I do, and I often end up at this chart from a post on Reddit. According to that chart, at 8 seconds I'll need an exposure of 59 seconds. It's also quite interesting to poke behind this chart, and you'll find that it actually used that equation we just mentioned from Yano. Funny how things go around in the film photography community. Anyhow, we can see here that uh, the adjusted time will be 52 up to 59 seconds, or a difference of 7 seconds depending on how we interpret the data. That might seem a lot, but think of it in exposure stops instead. It's only 0.1 stops difference between the slowest and the fastest time, and that won't be noticeable. But this shows that the reciprocity failure isn't night and day. There are some nuances to it. How about that other shot on no color studio number 12, which was ISO 6 and the required 8 seconds? Well, um, I kind of googled the reciprocity failure when out in the field, and I couldn't find any info, so I ended up using a general chart. I think it was the one found in the Wikipedia article, but I honestly can't remember. What I did note was that I opened the aperture to f16 and ended up doing an exposure of 30 seconds of this scene. And the results, a very dense, unusable, overexposed negative. What happened? Very apparently I grossly overexposed the scene. And there's two uh, principles in play here. Firstly, generally speaking, lower ISO films tend to have a lower degree of reciprocity failure. But that's not the one that made the difference on this film. You see, No Color Studio number 12 is a bit different. That's film on a paper base. And in my previous video, I stated that being film on paper, it might not need any adjustment at all for reciprocity failure. How did I come to that conclusion? As I couldn't find any info on the reciprocity failure for the number 12 film, not when googling or when checking the No Color Studios homepage, I started looking at other manufacturers that make film on paper, one being Washi. And on the data sheet for Washi W, you can read the following. The emulsion used for this film is similar with black and white paper emulsion. There is no problem to use it for long exposure in pinhole cameras. It can also be used as a printing paper. This to me hints that you don't need to add some time for reciprocity failure. And uh, my reasoning then being that No Color Studio number 12 would be very similar to Washi W. I also have this old note in the back of my mind that you don't need to adjust for reciprocity failure on normal photography paper. And this emulsion was supposed to be similar to that. I haven't been able to find a source that verifies that, but out in my darkroom, I can't remember ever having anything than a liner behavior when exposing normal photo paper. And exposures of 10 to 30 seconds isn't uncommon there. I also ended up emailing No Color Studio and got a fast reply, and they confirmed that on the number 12 film you don't need to add any time for reciprocity failure. Perhaps if you are exceeding 10 minutes, add half a stop just for good measure. So that kind of explains that very dense negative that I got. Reciprocity isn't everything. As you might know, I shoot quite a lot of FOMAPAN, even though it has horrible reciprocity failure. But it isn't really a factor for me. You see, shooting a 100 speed film in the summer time where I live, I rarely end up doing exposures longer than one second. When I do, it's just one or two seconds, and then it's not too bad. On the winter time, 400 speed is enough to keep the exposure time shorter than one second. So for me, in most general usage, reciprocity failure isn't a factor when deciding what film to shoot. One aspect that is important to me though when choosing a film, that's price, especially for my everyday shooting. 
and there, Fomapen is unmatched. Fomapen isn't alone as the low-cost option though, but there's two main reasons why I choose it. First, being it's available in pretty much all sizes, 135, 120, 4x5, 8x10, and you can even bulk load this stuff. And try looking up uh, 8x10 sheets. There's not a lot of manufacturers left there. To me, I can only get hold of three manufacturers. Kodak, Ilford, and Fomapan. Secondly, they make their own emulsion, along with paper, chemistry, filters for enlargers, etc. They are one of the few companies that's still keeping those stuff alive for us and this hobby alive, for me and you. To my knowledge, there's only four companies still around that makes all that stuff. It's Kodak, it's Ilford, it's Adox and Fomapan. And I like to support that. And out of those four, Fomapan is the cheapest. Especially a lot cheaper than Kodak. That's pretty much double the price, if not more, in the EU. However, I'm no stranger to the other brands like Adox, Ilford, uh, Rowley, Lumography, etc. etc. I especially enjoy shooting Kentmore 400 and Rowley RPX 400 in 135 and 120. My point being that reciprocity has never been the deciding factor for me when choosing a film, and it might not be for you either if you don't do a lot of long exposures. That was a lot of information. Let's try and summarize it and bring it back. 1. Check the reciprocity failure before heading out. You never know. 2. Reciprocity isn't the end of the world. I wouldn't consider it a deciding factor when choosing a general purpose film for my everyday shooting. Your mileage might vary though, and if I were going out on a scene or a location that I know requires a long exposure, well, then it's a factor, of course. 3. If you shot a scene with high dynamic range that required a long exposure, consider underdevelop, or perhaps try a semi stand in Rodonol or some other compensating developer. That's what I will be doing next time. But for normal, dull scenes, I'll just develop as normal. Fourth. There's very few hard truths out there. Most are just guidelines. Take them with a grain of salt and do your own tests. I also would like to add in that missing exposure isn't the end of the world. Most negative films have a few stops of exposure latitude, so you might still end up with a usable negative. It might be a bit dense or thin, but that's better than no negative at all. And remember, a boring image on a perfect negative, that's still a boring image. With that, thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye.